Um, uh, I knew George at Rice University uh, back in 1987, although um, we weren't very close friends, uh, but we went to the same dormitory uh, at Rice University. He is now a professor uh, at Utah, professor of law, and um, he's here to talk about open source stuff. And I, I normally would not do this, but I would like to ask um, uh, Professor Contreras, if, if you don't mind being interrupted in your talk, because I think there are a lot of people here who are like I was, uh, let's say three years ago, who don't know a lot of things about open source. And I'm sure your talk is designed to introduce it. But, but if we have questions for Professor George Contreras, I'd really like you to enter them here. And I'd like to be able to inter interrupt George and ask your questions. So it, it may be that no one has any questions, but if you do, please enter them in the Q&A tool or the Zoom chat, and we'll see if Professor Contreras can field them on the fly. Um, and I, I apologize, normally I'm a real tyrant with respect to time. Uh, so I've gotten a little bit late here. Everybody's gonna have to be pushed back a little bit. Please take it away, George. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Um, and, and of course, no problem at all if people want to interrupt me. I may just, because I've got some slides I'm going to show, I may not be able to see hands and stuff in the chat very well. Um, but just yell out, right? Just, just so I can sit class. I'll, and just I'll yell moderate, out. The, I'll moderate the questions. All right. So here, that, that's great. And thanks a lot for the introduction. And thanks for inviting me to be here. It's, it's been fascinating uh, so far from, uh, from the presentations I've heard. So, all right, let me know if you can't see those. In fact, what I'm gonna do is now that I've got that thing open, I am gonna, I'm gonna put the chat window and the Q&A window next to my slide window. Okay, so I should, I should be able to see this okay. Um, but still, like I said, don't, don't hesitate to yell out. All right, so, um, I'm here. I'm, I'm going to cover legal issues, right? And so this will be very basic and very repetitive for some people, uh, but hopefully it'll, it'll get us all onto the same page, right? Some people, I think, um, probably uh, will learn something from this. So uh, again, speed me up if you think I'm going too slow or if this is too basic. So open source. All right, open source started in the software world. These are some of the, uh, the people whose names you probably know uh, who were responsible for creating what's been called the open source movement. Richard Stallman, Linus Torvalds, Eric Raymond, of course. So what are the core principles underlying open source? Well, I think everybody in this conference would intuitively understand and agree with this, that information is freely available, whether it's software source code, product designs, or whatever. Um, there's no restriction on modification of whatever those uh, information modules are, and there's no, re no restriction on redistribution, right? Those are the core principles that people like Richard Stallman really objected to with commercial software licensing that he was confronting um, in the 70s um, and uh, he and others got together to create the open source movement to address these types of restrictions. Okay, so talking about software, I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk about products and designs, right? But historically, we got to start with software because that's where this began. Copyright is the legal framework that protects computer software pretty much everywhere around the world. It covers all works of authorship, right? And software is written by people, so it's considered a work of authorship. That's the source code, right? The programming language code, as well as the executable file, images that are displayed uh, by software, screen design, screen layouts, the user interfaces, um, product designs, uh, music, pretty much anything that can be written by a person is covered by copyright. Okay. What does copyright do as a legal form of protection? It gives its owner some exclusive rights, um, the right to reproduce that thing. So to make copies of it, uh, to modify it. And in copyright world, this is called making derivative works. And then importantly, the right to distribute it. And th there are other rights, like the right to perform a musical work and so forth. But, but these are 
the important ones really for our purposes. Um, of course, just because you own a copyright doesn't mean that nobody else can use that work, right? And this is the key to open source licensing. The owner of a copyright can authorize others to do any of those things that the owner has the exclusive right to. And that can be with or without charge. So you get a license from Microsoft to use Microsoft Word or PowerPoint. You paid something for that, um, but that isn't a legal requirement, right? That's only a commercial preference. So open source software um, has uh, developed more than 100 different license types um, that different creators have, have put in place to allow them to distribute software source code on open terms with one or more whistles or bells. These open source licenses are certified by something called the Open Source Initiative, OSI, um, basically to ensure that they all adopt these basic uh, principles that I mentioned before and, and a few others. Okay, now moving to hardware. Um, there are a lot of similarities between open source code software and open designs for hardware. The open source hardware movement begins in the 90s, and, and you may have covered this history elsewhere in this conference, so I'm going to just go through this very quickly. This, it, it, the adopters and were some of the same people who were involved in the open source code movement. They were engineers, uh, double E's, hardware tinkerers with soldering irons and circuit boards and, and so forth that they like to play around with. Um, for them, in the open source hardware world, the, the principles are very similar to those in open source software, except that instead of an executable program, we're talking about a physical thing, usually, a thing that is being made. Um, and the license for the, uh, the hardware generally applies to the design file. Um, now, a design file, of course, enables you or teaches you how to make something, and, and sometimes it even includes software in it. Um, but the output of an open source hardware project is a physical thing, a respirator, a ventilator, you name it. Um, because these are physical products, patents are more relevant than they are to the software world. And I'm going to talk a bit more about patents in, in just a moment. Um, open source hardware, it, it is the, the, the legal aspects of it are not nearly as well developed as they are in the software world. However, there are some institutions that have taken up um, open source hardware and CERN, the uh, particle physics laboratory in uh, Switzerland, um, the source of the World Wide Web and lots of other great technology, um, started to get interested in open source hardware a decade ago and released a series of licenses, um, the open source hardware license from CERN, um, that, that have gotten some traction in the field. There are a number of others, open source hardware licenses. Um, but the CERN ones, I think, are pretty good and they're pretty robust. And I would guess that they're probably the most widely used, but I could be proven wrong. Um, one advantage of them is the OSHL has been certified by the Open Software um, Initiative, and uh, the current version of it has three flavors, a permissive flavor, a weakly reciprocal, and a strongly reciprocal flavor, mirroring the sentiments of three different types of open source software licenses, the GNU general public license, the lesser general public license, and a series of um, very weak but permissive licenses, um, including what's called the BSD license, the Apache license, and so forth. <clears throat> I'll talk in a second about what, what these mean. OK, so jumping back to software, because again, I think, I think it's a little easier to understand in the software world. The basic rights that one of these licenses conveys are that the license is open to the public. Anybody who wants to download and use the software can agree to the terms of the license. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, 
comment. Okay, uh, public licenses are available to all comers. They are self-executing, right? You don't need to sign and negotiate a licensing agreement with somebody. Everybody gets the same agreement. It's basically a quick wrap. Um, it's self-executing. It gives you the right to modify, right? This is the core principle of open source software. Everybody should be able to modify their software uh, source code and then redistribute it. Um, redistribute the original source code plus modifications. And again, this is pretty radical, or it was back uh, in the early days because companies seriously guarded their software source code. These were the crown jewels of software companies like Microsoft. Um, the thought that you could just freely redistribute source code was, was uh, again, a pretty radical idea at the time, even though we've very much internalized it today. Um, and in addition to the right to distribute the source code, of course, you know, what executes on a computer is the executable. In the hardware equipment world, we think about the product, right? Just like open source software, we've got a design um, and then that gets transformed into a product, just like source code gets transformed into an executable software file. Okay. So there are often more strings attached to open source code licenses than the permissions I just mentioned. I often, there, there, there's often no charge uh, to these. That's not required, but it certainly is the custom. There's almost never any kind of warranty. So, you know, you buy Microsoft PowerPoint and it doesn't work when you install it, yeah, you can get your money back or get a repair. In open source code, generally there is no warranty. There is usually some requirement of attribution. That is, you've got to acknowledge the originator of that software. Um, often there's a requirement that you convey the source code with the executable program. Um, and then, there is what's called the share alike feature, sometimes called copy left, which is a pun, of course, on copyright. Um, and this is the defining characteristic of the general public license series of uh, licenses. It basically says, if you take a piece of software that's licensed under the GPL and modify it or create a program that's a derivative work of that GPL software. Yeah. Then when you redistribute it, the redistributed software also must be distributed under the GPL. That is scary to companies many times uh, because they feel that this GPL software could infect their proprietary code. It's called, and you know, this, uh, uh, language of epidemiology has uh, really been adopted here. This is called the viral effect of the GPL because it can potentially um, cause you to release your what you thought was proprietary software under this open source code license if it includes GPL software. And we'll come back to how this works in the hardware world in a second. Another key point to note here is that open source licenses are not the public domain. You can contribute your intellectual property to the public domain, uh, patents, copyrights, and so forth. Uh, if you do that, then nobody has any right to control their use. Um, and that may be a desirable pathway for some types of works, but Granting a license, an open source license, is a little different. It's not quite as far as the public domain. Um, and why would you decide to do that instead of just releasing something to the public domain? Well, the reason is that you, the holder of the IP right, you can then control downstream uses. Um, you can require that somebody give you attribution. You can require that uh, whoever uses your software has to then make the source code available. If you just set it free into the, um, into the wild, so to speak, into the public domain, people can do whatever they want with it. They can re-propertize it, right? They could take your open source product, bring it in house, put it in a proprietary product, and uh, then keep it proprietary. Um, and so the copyright owner then loses all right to control what happens downstream. All right. Um, Robert asked me to talk for a moment about trademarks also, uh, which do come up. Trademarks are a slightly different species of intellectual property law. They cover 
words, symbols, any designs that indicate the source of a product, right? You see a soft drink can that's red with the white swoosh on it and fancy script. Yeah, you're assuming it, it comes from the Coca-Cola company. You have some idea what's gonna be inside of it, what the quality of it is and so forth. Usually open source licenses don't cover trademarks at all. Um, if you download a piece of open source software um, from Microsoft and want to redistribute it, you generally can't redistribute it under Microsoft's trademarks. Um, you can often modify and distribute the code, but not using the owner's brand. That usually requires a separate type of license. And if people have more questions about trademarks, I'm happy to answer those. That's pretty much all I have to say about them right now because I do want to spend a little bit more time talking about patents. And I know patents have come up. I've heard people mention patents um, in previous talks. I think most people have some sense of what they are. Um, in general, patents cover inventions, right? Those can be physical devices. They can be methods of doing something. They can be compositions of matter. All sorts of things that are invented can be patented. Code generally is not patented, right? It's generally protected by copyright, just like you can't patent, you know, your favorite short story or a poem. Uh, you can't patent uh, a photograph or a painting. Those works of authorship are protected by copyright. Patents cover things, inventions. Um, the, the, the common explanation given about software code is, you know, you can invent a new method for sorting, uh, you know, 500,000 uh, numbers. Um, there are an infinite number of ways, an infinite number of coding languages and so forth uh, that you can use to code that function. The key invention might be a super fast methodology for doing the sort, um, again, these days, which may or may not be patentable. But what you can't patent for sure is simply the, um, the code implementation of that function. Now, design documents, think of those the same way. A document generally does not get patented. The thing that the design document uh, shows you how to design is the patentable thing, right? That's the physical device. A design file itself can't infringe a patent. Now, we do have something called inducement to infringe. If you uh, show people how to infringe a patent, the patent owner can often sue you for showing those people, for telling them how to infringe. Um, and that's, again, something to watch out for that we can talk about a little bit more later. Um, but at the basic level, only the products made to the design are going to be infringing. So a patent, just like copyright, gives the owner some exclusive rights, the exclusive right to make, use, sell, offer for sale, or import into the relevant country that product. And the key point here is that patents are national. They only cover one country at a time. I get a US patent, it only covers the US. My thing is patented in the US, you take it to Australia, and make it, use it, sell it there. I, there's nothing I can do about it if all I have is a US patent. No, many companies who have a US patent will go to other countries and patent their thing there also. And there are treaties in place, one of the most important to call the Patent Cooperation Treaty that makes it easier for me to file my Australian, my European, my Japanese, you know, you name it, patent application if I've already got one in the US. But I do have to go through the trouble and spend the money to get the patent in every country where I want protection. Important point, because most inventions are not patented everywhere in the world. Patents, they, just a final piece, they last for 20 years, 20 years uh, from the date of filing. It, it usually takes two to three more years to, uh, to get the patent through the patent office. So by the time it issues, it has, you know, maybe 17 years left on it. Um, drugs uh, take an exceptionally long time to get through FDA approval in the United States and similar approval in other countries. By the time a drug 
uh, patent issues and the uh, the drug is marketable, it often just has 11 to 13 years of life, which is still a lot, um, you know, by any uh, by any standard. Okay, patent claims. Um, this is an important point, and 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 Rob, let me know if I'm going over. I need to wrap it up, but but <laughs> just... um, you're going over, and you need to wrap it up. Okay, okay. What are the claims? Patents are protect words, right? Not things. Here's an example. I claim a sandwich comprised of a slice of cheese, laterally situated between two slices of bread, right? That's a sandwich. I can patent that. You might think I could then prevent you from making a cheese sandwich, which I could do, but it goes a lot farther, right? That patent claim, it covers any type of bread, any type of cheese, any type of other stuff that's also between the bread, right? So with my little patent on a cheese sandwich, if it's written broadly enough, I can prevent you uh, or at least charge you money for making the Big Mac where the cheese is there. See, there's the cheese, there's the bread, um, but you've got 20 other ingredients in there. It's still covered by my patent. What does this mean? Um, two ways to think about patents in terms of open source. First, the patents held by the contributors. If you have a patent on some function and then you release it as open source, generally you can't go sue people um, for, that, uh, for that software or that, that design. The more important thing to know is what about other people's patents? Because you can infringe patents without knowing about it. There's no intent required, right? You don't have to go out intentionally to infringe a patent. You can just infringe it without knowing it because those claims like my cheese sandwich claims can be very broad and especially in areas like software and electronics, they can be very vague. If you do intentionally infringe somebody's patent, there can be extra damages, but it's not required. You can infringe even without knowing about it. So to be safe, often, people making a product will try to search patents and see if they are infringing, trying to understand what the landscape is of patents covering some particular product. But that's not a cheap thing to do. Remember, you've got to do it in every country that you care about. And one important thing to take away is, again, in countries where there's no patent, you do not need a license. You can operate freely. All right. I'm just going to wrap this up saying one way that uh, in the open sort of in innovation world, we've gotten around patents is companies pledging, making voluntary commitments to um, make their patents available without charge for certain uh, applications. And the open COVID pledge was a project that, um, that Rob knows well, we've talked about before, in which a number of companies got together, pledged their patents to the COVID-19 response. Um, this happened with a number of uh, products from simple plastic, uh, 3D printed uh, plastic medical devices to uh, ventilators and, and ventilators and ventilator equipment. Um, uh, some of the people who, who've been responsible for these you've heard from at this conference, but uh, in, in what we think is a very successful way. So that's it. Um, I really appreciate the time and uh, happy to you know, follow up however you'd like. Okay, thank you. Um, I have here a copy of George's book um, that <laughs> I think is being mentioned quite a bit. Uh, this is about patenting of genomes. Uh, he recently published this and I think is uh, promoting it. And I'd like to thank him for being here. There are a few questions from the audience which I'd, I'd like to present. I don't think we're gonna have too much time for uh, all of these, but but let me try to read one of these. So, uh, Mashad asks, "Can you patent algorithms?" I think. Yeah, yeah. So, the complicated question will vary by country. I mean, the the theoretical answer is no. You you can't patent uh, you can't patent a mathematical formula or an algorithm, but companies and, and researchers definitely get around that restriction. They, they, uh, they patent a method of doing something using the algorithm, right? So those definitely are patented. 
Right. So there's, there's, in the context of the question, the short answer is yes, you can patent an algorithm. No, you can't patent code. So, Azad Mashari asked, what will be the status of works done under this open COVID pledge once the pandemic is declared over, e.g. Medtronic derivative ventilators, et cetera? So, so Medtronic's pledge, um, they did it individually. Um, Medtronic and Smith's group uh, did, did their own pledges even before the open COVID pledge uh, came about. But, but all of these pledges are limited to the COVID-19 pandemic, right? I mean, this was viewed at the beginning of 2020 as a response to a, an emerging global emergency. Um, and, and, you know, what happens after that, this is open. It's subject to uh, discussion and negotiation. Um, but, you know, those, those for-profit companies who did this voluntarily, they did it uh, to address a, a pending emergency. And um, I don't know what they're going to do. I, I don't speak for Medtronic. I don't know what they're going to do. Um, so I'd like to just point out something, and maybe I'm abusing my power as a moderator here. This is the public inventions uh, licensing strategy. We use different licenses for different kinds of matter. Um, so for hardware, uh, for example, the Ventmon here, we use the CERN open hardware license, which Professor Contreras mentioned. For other things like documentation, we, we use almost public domain, we use CC0. For code, we use share-alike licenses, and for almost all art, we use share-alike licenses. And the, the principle that George mentioned is the idea of a share-alike license is you can use it, but if you make a contribution or an improvement, you're supposed to share that alike with other people on the same basis with which it was shared to you. Um, so that's what public invention recommends. And this is this is a little bit of a tricky subject. Um, I asked to speak about trademarks because I believe this is something important for business people to understand. Okay, this is the Ventmon device made by public invention. Public invention owns all copyrights on this. There are no patents. We never apply for patent. You see, it says public invention and Ventmon. Those are trademarks of public invention. I do not allow anyone to use the trademark public invention, but the design for this is completely published. It's, uh, it's available. Anyone, for example, Larry Kilizuski, who owns a firm that's capable of doing it, could start manufacturing these right now, and I would be very happy, and I have no legal... I could not stop him. I would not wish to stop him. I, I hope Larry decides to manufacture this and make a million dollars and he doesn't have to give me anything. But he's not allowed to say public invention without talking to me, without forming a contract. And I, the reason I think this is so important is people are afraid of liability and, and they, they don't want this to be made poorly and reflect upon the designer, okay? But you can make this, you just can't say it's a public invention product. And the same holds true for, for example, Harvard University or Rice University. And I think that distinction of maintaining your marks and your trademarks is very important for retaining some of the control that organizations want. So often you hear people say, well, we'd like to share our technology, but we're afraid of, liability or we're afraid of someone misusing it and, and so forth. And retaining your trademarks is a way to um, uh, sort of prevent that that problem. So it, it, it's, it's a very, I mean, you gotta think of Medtronic, right? I mean, Medtronic was generous in making its design files available for some ventilators, but if, if the, the people who make ventilator replacement parts cannot label them Medtronic because just think of what would happen if it was faulty, um, and, and patients died in a hospital, they look at the part and they're going to say, oh, it says Medtronic. We're going to sue Medtronic. And, and that honestly is not fair <laughs> to Medtronic um, to, to be sued for a part that somebody else made. Uh, so it, it does make sense. Okay. So there's a lot more we could talk about here. It's a complicated subject. It's necessary. I don't think everybody has to be an expert, but it is the everybody who's opening, operating an open source field needs to basically understand the talk that, that George just gave. Um, you kind of need to, to know 
that stuff. But it's it's fairly easy to learn. It's not that complicated. Okay. Now, uh, I'm afraid we have a lot of rich material here, but I have to cut this off. Um, there may be more questions. I would ask um, if George has time to go to the Rehive instance and go to the table, which says meet the speakers, just click on it and you'll appear there. And people will be able to ask additional questions if George has time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you may be able to get questions answered. My, my um, colleague Megan asked a few questions and Victoria Jacqua did, which I thought were too complicated to raise to you. Um, right now, George, 